everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to our session, first session. Actually, I think this is our second session for, for today. Um, so thank you for joining us for the Keeping Your Incredible Hulk Under Control and What Happens When It's Not. Uh, Pre-surgical preparation and hypertensive crisis. Um, this is the Fiopera Alliance virtual conference. Um, my name is Dr. Shauna Snyder, and I am actually a patient, and I will be your moderator today. Um, I'm here with uh, Dr. Nazari and Dr. Cohen, um, and I will introduce them uh, further here in just a moment. Um, but first, um, we'll do some housekeeping and um, let you know that this program is brought to you by the Fiopera Alliance. Um, our mission is to empower patients with pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma, their families and medical professionals through advocacy, education, and a global community of support while helping to advocate research that accelerates treatments and cures. So uh, we'd like to give a special thanks to Progenix and Advanced Accelerator Applications for making this conference possible as sponsors. Um, and before we um, get started, I do want to mention that this is also Theo Para Awareness Week. Um, so please engage in any of those activities. You can find many of those activities out on our social media. Um, and of course, FeoPara.org um, has a lot of different things that you can engage in. It also has a toolkit that, um, that'll give you lots more information about our awareness week. So this is Pheochromocytoma Paraganglioma Awareness Week. Um, so join us for that. Um, all right, so uh, today our agenda is gonna be um, for several minutes here. And um, Dr. Cohen is going to present first for 25 minutes. Um, and actually, I, I'm not sure how they have this split up. I'm gonna let them, I think they know how they have it split up. So I'll, I'll let them do that. Um, but after our two doctors speak, um, I'll also give you a brief history of my experience and give you some tips and tricks um, that go along with our session today. So we'll do a, a little wellness session on that. Um, our disclaimer for today is that the information that is presented in this webinar is for educational purposes only and should not substitute the advice of your doctors and medical team because they do know your individual case and they have an in-depth knowledge of your medical history and your current situation. Um, so it's also important to know that none of the content you're going to hear here is um, influenced by any of our sponsors or supporters. All right, and now I would like to introduce our experts for this session. So first we have uh, Dr. Debbie Cohen, who is a professor of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. She's a nephrologist and is the director of the hypertension program at Penn. She has an interest in complex hypertension and adrenal hypertension and is the director of the pheochromocytoma paraganglioma program at Penn with a focus on the treatment and management of pheochromocytoma. Um, Dr. Matthew Nazari is a clinical research fellow working with Dr. Carol Potsock at the NIH in Bethesda, Maryland. He is an internal medicine and pediatric physician at Georgetown University Hospital. His research has focused on the cardiovascular implications of excess catecholamine states. Um, he and his colleagues have further characterized catecholamine-induced, excuse me, um, tachyrrhythmias, let me say that right, uh, hypertension crisis, coronary arterial involvement, and subsequent management. That's what his research is on. All right, so Dr. Cohen is going to take it away first. Welcome, Dr. Cohen. Can you see my screen? Um, yes, we can. Okay. We do see your notes on this side. Yeah. You may want to put Hang it on. in slide mode. Oh, this is not the wrong thing. Hang on. Um, sorry, wrong thing. Why does this coming up? Um, sorry, let me just do this again. Um, get up back. Sorry. Okay. 
hopefully we're good now. I'm just trying to put it on presentation. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. Firstly, thanks to the Field Paralines for inviting me today. And, you know, um, this is a important week for, um, you know, field para awareness. And I've spent the last 20 years um, working very closely with patients with um, field, field para, you know, disease. And as my um, experience as a hypertension specialist and nephrologist, you know, I've been involved in generally I was trying to think about it. I think I've blocked at least 800 people for surgery. It's incredible when thinking about that. So today I'm going to just tell you a little bit about my experience. So um, the title is what happens, um, oh, keeping your incredible health under control and what happens when it's not pre-surgical preparation. Okay, so I thought I'd just start briefly with a little um, case because, you know, this is how we... Um, you know, this is a typical situation. So this is a patient that I've seen, a 22-year-old um, white female with recurrent strep tonsillitis who was admitted for an elective tonsillectomy with no prior surgical medical history except for migraine headaches. And during the induction of anesthesia, so when they started to put the patient under, she had a massive surge in her blood pressure and they had to abort the surgery. So the blood pressure went, as you can see, from 110 over 70 to 200 over 136. So she was seen by a cardiology um, and had an echo and a stress test, which were both normal except for mild and increased heart rate. And she was on no medications aside from the oral contraceptive tablet. Let's screen is not um, progressing. Oh. Yeah, we go. Sorry. Physical exam was normal. And as you can see on even the blood pressure on the exam afterwards was not that elevated, just 130 over 94, but the heart rate was a little high for somebody of that age and generally healthy, 96 per minute. And interestingly, when the patient stood up, her blood pressure actually went up by, um, I'm mean, sorry, she had a drop in her blood pressure by 12, 12 millimeters when she stood up but the heart rate increased to 110 per minute. So we ordered all the usual labs that we would, and you can see that the plasma metanephrines were about five times normal. So prior to surgery, um, you know, what, what medication should we use? So, you know, just for the audience, I don't know, you know, your level of knowledge, but, you know, there's a lot of different options. I mean, do we go with beta blocker, ACE inhibitors, non-selective alpha blockers, selective alpha blockers, calcium channel blocker, diuretic, for example. So when we look at the physiology of um, the catecholamines, how they produced, you can actually see here that this is the normal, um, um, the way that catecholamines are synthesized or made. So just to make it a little bit more simple, a little bit more simple, it actually starts off in the in the brain with a hormone called tyrosine, which is converted in the brain to L-dopa actually, then goes to gets converted to dopamine, then norepinephrine. Then norepinephrine then gets converted to epinephrine in your adrenal gland. And these are the breakdown products of epinephrine and norepinephrine, so normedinephrines and metanephrines. So what we do when we get these blockers, most tumors produce predominantly norepinephrine and norepinephrine, and this is where we use our alpha blockers um, to block the, the action of these hormones. But tyrosine is another um, medication that we don't use very often anymore, but that actually decreases um, catecholamine synthesis. So it blocks this hormone, so it blocks this pathway. So just to kind of summarize, all patients with hormonally um, functional um, fear or paragangliomas should undergo um, preoperative blockade to prevent um, any kind of cardiovascular complications. So alpha blockers should be the first choice um, to minimize any complications. However, there's very little evidence about trials looking at whether you should use um, non-selective versus selective alpha blockers. So what is the difference? So non-selective alpha blocker is for not the, the, um, 
the only one available in the U.S. is already is phenoxybenzamine. And it's, this is the one that's most commonly used because of its non-selective action on the receptor. So it actually blocks the receptor completely and it has a very long duration of action. So you're going to get a much more complete blockade. Selective alpha blockers such as doxazosin, prazosin, terazosin, they only block the alpha-1 receptors, not alpha-2. So they can be much more easily displaced from the receptor so you don't get such a complete block. And um, so generally non-selective alpha blockers are preferred, but the people are using more selective alpha blockers more and more. And I'll give you a little bit more in depth in that. So which alpha blocker is actually best? Phenoxybenzamine versus azosin. So one of those non-selective alpha blockers. So there are really only two um, studies. And I mean, none of these are very robust. So this was a retrospective study from the Mayo Clinic um, and the Cleveland Clinic, and they combined um, their patients. There were 87 patients total. Um, so Mayo Clinic mainly had used um, uh, phenoxybenzamine and Cleveland Clinic um, mainly, mainly had used the um, Zosin drugs. And what they really showed is there was similar efficacy, but the phenoxybenzamine group had much more stable blood pressure during surgery. And However, they, are, they needed more medication after surgery. So we call them vasopressors. So medication that actually raises your blood pressure after surgery to maintain blood pressure after surgery because you've got that complete block. Then there was this prospective study from Europe. This is 134 patients. I think there were 66 and 68, the group that got phenoxybenzamine versus one of those Zosin drugs. And the phenoxybenzamine group again, re well, required more beta blocker prior to surgery because you're getting a much more complete alpha blockade. So they become more tachycardic or the heart rate goes higher, but during surgery, much more stable blood pressure. So really that's the, the, the only evidence we really have. So what do we normally do? We usually use phenoxybenzamine in a dose of around 10 milligrams to 60 milligrams a day and we titrate it up. The main side effects with all the alpha blockers are severe postural hypertension. So when you stand up, your blood pressure drops, your heart rate goes up. So that's, I always tell patients that's a good thing because I know they're blocked and then we usually add a beta blocker. They often also get nasal congestion and you can get GI side effects. We usually begin these, these blockers about two to three weeks prior to surgery or as soon as the diagnosis is confirmed and then you know we prepare for surgery. So the most important thing is, um, at least for physicians, is never to use a beta block until someone is fully alpha blocked, because what happens is that you can actually get a hypertensive crisis. Um, so once, once someone is um, alpha blocked and their heart rate goes up, then we add the beta blocker and uh, about two thirds of patients will need a beta blocker. So for um, the, the non-selective alpha blockers, these are the common doses that we usually use. We preferentially use doxazosin, and it's just because we have the most experience with that. Um, but the way that I usually do, if someone has very high catecholamines, metanephrines, we just use phenoxybenzamine. And if they're having a procedure, they have low, very low level um, catecholamines, we usually use the zosin drugs. And it also depends on insurance because some people have a zero copay or $10 copay for phenoxybenzamine and some people have like a few hundred dollars. So then, we, you know, we'll go with the doxazosin. But you, I mean, if I have a preference, I prefer to use the phenoxybenzamine. This I'm not going to really say too much about because we don't use it too much anymore. But this is the um, tyrosine hydroxylase that prevents um, catecholamine synthesis. Um, we used to use it a lot, but then it wasn't available for a long time. So we stopped using it. And honestly, you know, the patients seem to really much worse. So we use this mostly for patients who have chronic metastatic disease with symptoms and that can help symptom control. So during surgery, we expect the typical response is to see the blood pressure increase when the tumor is manipulated and then to see a massive drop in the blood pressure once the tumor is removed. And during surgery, they either use like an IV alpha blocker called fentolamine, 
or calcium channel blocker called nicardipine to just try and maintain the blood pressure and prevent surges. And it's not uncommon for people post-op to require what we call an alpha agonist. So that's the opposite of the alpha blocker to, to now bring up the blood pressure um, because we've blocked them. So very important, you know, that you give alpha blockade for, for multiple scenarios, not just for surgery, but for people, for example, who, who have, you know, high catecholamines for if they're getting hepatic embolization or biopsy of any type, um, certain chemotherapies, particularly um, the tyrosine tyro tyro kinase inhibitors and, and MIBG therapy, we even do for radiation. So I just want to say a short word about the beta blockers is that, as I said, you should never use it before you alpha block because you can get a hypertensive crisis. But there are different types of beta blockers with these selective as well as non-selective like in alpha blocker. And um, there's really no evidence to use one over the other. I personally prefer short-acting metoclopramide tartrate because it's short-acting. So if there's an issue, you can, you can, you know, it won't take a long time to overcome that. The one thing I do want to say is that you should not use labetalol because actually labetalol is a combined alpha beta blocker. So people often think that's a good idea, but it's much more potent beta than alpha about nine to one. So you can actually get a hypertensive crisis. So this should not be used. Calcium channel bl blockers are the most often add on drug to help improve blood pressure control and it shouldn't really be used as monotherapy. Just if somebody has very, very mild hypertension, um, or they have severe orthostatic hypertension with alpha blockers, but generally we do not use this as a first line therapy. And then this is just a study we did at Penn, just to show you, this is a 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure monitor. When someone wears a monitor and we monitor their blood pressure, um, this is pre-surgery and you can see how labeled the blood pressure is. This is like up, down, up, down the whole day. This is after surgery, this is pretty normal. So normal during a 24 hour period. So you can see how post-op the blood pressure has normalized. So um, what we do pre-procedure, we make sure everyone has a home cup, blood pressure cup. We, we tell them to bring it to the clinic so it can be calibrated. And then we tell them to send their blood pressure and heart rate readings every one to two days so we can adjust their medication accordingly. This is actually my nurse that I work with, Bonnie Bennett. She gives everybody this um, handout and she gives them links to the field para cartoons to explain more about the disease. It shows them how to chart their blood pressure and then gives them a handout saying, you know, this is what you're meant to take, what to stop, et cetera, et cetera. So just information and then what to do even after surgery, you know, and when they'll come back, for example, when to repeat catecholamines. So just a lot of, um, you know, information for the patient so that they, you know, have a good understanding of what we're getting into. So just to, to summarize everything I've said, really there's no, no randomized control trials really, you know, done um, except for that one that I told you about. So there's no real accepted protocol. People, you know, at different centers may be two different things, but everyone is, you know, the standard of care is using alpha blockade. Um, and just, you know, as a patient, you should make sure that you never undergo any type of procedure or treatment without alpha blockade if you are secreting. The normal thing is to block for seven to 14 days to a, um, prior to surgery or procedure to allow adequate time to normalize the blood pressure and heart rate. For example, for radiation and like high dose MRBG, what we do now is block for a week before and one week into the treatment. And the target blood pressure is really 130 over 80, ideally with a heart rate of like 60 to 70. And um, I'll finish there. This is just to advertise our um, next uh, big um, international FIO meeting in October. And hopefully we're going to, you know, learn more and share our research and, you know, um, bring more to this community. Anyway, I'll stop there. And um, thanks for your attention. And I'm now going to um, hand over to Dr. Nazari. He's going to talk about hypertensive crisis. There we are.
Okay, can everyone see my screen? Got my Albert here. Here we go. All right. So um, my name is Matthew Nasri, and I work here uh, at the NIH in the NICHD uh, with Dr. Pitsak. And today I'm going to be talking to you about catecholamine induced hypertensive crises and their management. Um, first and foremost, thank you so much, the FIOPARA Alliance, um, for inviting me uh, to give this talk today. Um, I have to say, I really like the the uh, the theme uh, of keeping your Hulk under control as sort of a fellow uh, superhero fan. I have no disclosures. Um, and so a catecholamine induced hypertensive crisis is really defined by two things. The first is that <clears throat> the 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 hypertension is severe. It, it uh, technically is above 180 over 110 uh, meters of mercury. Uh, and it's due itself to excessive catecholamines, and it may or may not be uh, present with associated target organ damage. Um, one thing to be aware of is certain things can really sort of bring your Hulk out or trigger a catecholamine release, and therefore these catecholamine-induced hypertensive crises. Um, and, and that includes mainly medications and stress, uh, either emotional or physical, but also tumor instability. So uh, any type of, of trauma or even manipulation of a tumor um, can lead to significant release of catecholamines. There's a few medications that I want to highlight here, um, one of them being metoclopramide or Reglan and steroids, which are, uh, those are two sort of very dangerous medications uh, to give somebody who has pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma, especially if they're not blocked. There's also some pathomimetics that include things like nicotine, caffeine, and amphetamines. Um, tyramine, which is produced uh, really in a lot of fermented foods like wine, beer, or cheese. And then reuptake inhibitors like SSRIs or SNRIs. A lot of antidepressants are reuptake inhibitors. So uh, hypertension is quite prevalent in FIOPARA patients. About 95% uh, of secretory patients have hypertension, um, and it can be either paroxysmal or persistent. Um, and in one study, uh, a little over half of a percent of patients who have hypertension were actually found to have a pheochromocytoma or a paraganglioma. Um, severe hypertension or a catecholamine-induced hypertensive crisis is unfortunately uh, these are, are quite prevalent and life-threatening. So the number one cause of, of uh, death is really adverse cardiovascular events um, with, with uh, sort of major causes being myocardial infarctions or heart attacks and strokes. So there are two uh, biochemical phenotypes with, with associated uh, patterns of symptoms. The first is, is this adrenergic biochemical phenotype. Uh, where the influence of epinephrine really predominates. And because epinephrine is released uh, episodically, so ep ep epinephrine episodic, you can get uh, episodes of severe hypertension and there's often more tachycardia. So patients will report feeling more palpitations. Um, and epinephrine is really a hormone, principally a hormone. Um, so it's released by the adrenal medulla. And so oftentimes patients who have significant epinephrine have an adrenal tumor. Um, and these tumors, it's important to note, um, store a tremendous amount of, of epinephrine. So to the extent where some of them st are storing 98% of their epinephrine and only releasing about two to 5% of that epinephrine a day into circulation. In contrast is the noradrenergic biochemical phenotype. So this is where the influence of norepinephrine really predominates. And because norepinephrine is released uh, typically in a continuous fashion, these patients more often have continuous symptoms. So they have continuous hypertension. They may have less tachycardia. 
And norepinephrine naturally is, is chiefly a neurotransmitter. So uh, in patients with these tumors, the high amounts of norepinephrine that circulate in the bloodstream can then be taken back up by the nerves in a process known as reuptake um, and then uh, and stored there in uh, very uh, excessive uh, quantities so that uh, any type of sympathetic stress or even emotional stress can actually trigger tremendous release of norepinephrine and lead to a crisis. Um, and also in contrast to the adrenergic phenotype, tumors that release uh, predominantly norepinephrine tend to store it less. So uh, they may be releasing more than 50% of the norepinephrine that they store into circulation daily. And this sort of underscores uh, one point, and that's that uh, though tumors that that secrete predominantly epinephrine are less common. They're the ones that you have to worry about. So if you could imagine a patient who has a very large adrenal tumor, who's storing 98% of their epinephrine, um, and let's say they have trauma or something that directly uh, sort of squeezes or presses upon that tumor, um, it, can, it can really lead to life-threatening complications. <laughs> So there are complications and comorbid conditions in uh, catecholamine-induced hypertensive crises. So when the hypertension becomes uh, very elevated, it can actually damage uh, tissues within your body. And the common patterns are things like heart attacks or, or myocardial infarctions, um, strokes and acute heart failure. Um, and then a few other things that can be seen are things like aortic dissection and myocarditis. This is where uh, there's damage to the biggest blood vessel uh, in your body, which is the aorta, um, and it can cause inflammation of the heart, which is known as myocarditis. Um, also, uh, some, sometimes uh, CIHC can be very challenging, um, and that's when the hypertension is associated with a tachyarrhythmia or simultaneous arrhythmia of the heart where the beat is, uh, where the heartbeat is beating irregularly. Um, and the, these can be a really challenging to simultaneously treat. About 15% of patients who have a, a crisis may have one of these arrhythmias. Most of the time it's sinus tachycardia. So the heart is uh, beating as it usually does, just faster. Um, but it can also include atrial fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia. And those especially can decompensate uh, into cardiac arrest. And, and finally, I won't talk about this too much, but you can see low blood pressures while treating um, these very high blood pressures. And uh, I, I just want to touch on um, hypovolemia. So uh, patients with pheopera, um, because their, their blood vessels are so constricted, um, a lot of the time that can lead to volume leaving the intravascular space. So the volume within the actual blood vessels uh, decreases over time. And in patients, in secretory patients with Pheopera, they have about 10 to 15% less blood volume. Um, and that volume corresponds to, a, to basically the equivalent volume of about two units of blood in your average individual. So upon treatment, um, typically with something that causes these vessels to rapidly expand, uh, when those vessels expand, the volume that remains within them uh, can be inadequate, and that can lead to low blood pressures. So when you see patients, um, or, or oftentimes, you know, we ask patients when we start treating them or with blockade, um, to uh, drink a lot of fluids, eat salty foods. And the same thing can happen when you're treating this acutely and you have to give intravenous fluids. Uh, and so oftentimes that hypovolemic hypotension or that, that low blood pressure due to low volume will correct with fluids. And if it doesn't, it may be due to other forms of hypotension or shock, which I won't go into, um, but they can be due to, to abnormalities in how blood flow is distributed or a problem with the actual heart. So treatment in these patients uh, really follows a, a linear rationale um, in that the way uh, 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 hypertension occurs is catecholamines bind to their receptors, and those receptors then lead to a rise in calcium. And it's that calcium that stimulates the heart and the blood vessels uh, and ultimately leads to high blood pressure. 
or what we call this hypertensive crisis. And so um, in tandem, we uh, use adrenoceptor blockers, calcium channel blockers, and then nitrates uh, in these patients to treat uh, CIHC. There are a few other agents that can be useful but are seldom used. Those include magnesium sulfate. So magnesium uh, naturally sort of antagonizes calcium. And uh, in FIOPERA patients, it, it can be a, a very potent antihypertensive. It can lower the blood pressure, but it can also help to relieve arrhythmias or treat arrhythmias. Uh, another agent is phenoldepam, which is, is sort of rarely used for um, CIHC, um, but uh, despite limited experience, the experience is actually quite favorable. So um, if, if uh, someone has continued hypertension or a fiopera patient has persistent hypertension, it could be considered as an agent to add on perhaps as a last resort. And um, echoing sort of the sentiments of Dr. Cohen, uh, we like to avoid labetalol because labetalol, uh, whether taken intravenously or orally, is about uh, one to three or one to seven alpha to beta blockade, which means that it's predominantly a beta blocker. Um, and it can precipitate uh, that hypertension or make it worse, uh, again, as, as Dr. Cohen uh, nicely explained. We also avoid diuretics. So uh, as we discussed, because the blood volume is lower, you really don't want to excessively um, lead to further volume depletion. And finally, we also recommend avoiding hydralazine because although uh, in the short term, it can lower the blood pressure, it can have a very long effect of stimulating the heart, uh, which you don't wanna do when the catecholamines are also stimulating the heart and vasculature. So I wanted to finish off by discussing a few published cases and you can see uh, the citations in the bottom right here. Um, and I'm gonna, going to uh, probably paraphrase a little bit. So the first case is a 36-year-old male who underwent an adrenalectomy for pheochromocytoma. He was medicated with a variety of uh, anesthetic agents, um, but also received labetalol. Um, and then after uh, 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 the induction of anesthesia, the blood pressure rose. Uh, you can see here to 178 over 101 mmHg. Um, and then uh, he received more labetalol, and it was found that his systemic vascular resistance was increasing, and the blood pressure um, sort of uh, paradoxically increased despite the fact that he was receiving labetalol. Um, and you can see here it's uh, now 247 over 150. Um, so the, the, the take-home point here is really to avoid labetalol as, as monotherapy or not to give labetalol all by itself. If you want to uh, treat tachycardia or an arrhythmia with labetalol in a pheopera patient, it's important to make sure that you have adequate alpha blockade first. This next case here is a 36-year-old female who presents to an emergency department with nausea, vomiting, and otherwise doesn't have any known uh, diagnoses. <clears throat> she re uh, receives metoclopramide or Reglan for that nausea. And then an hour later, the blood pressure is extremely high at 223 over 102 uh, meter, uh, millimeters of mercury. So uh, it was suspected that the patient had a reaction to the Reglan. Um, and she then received methylprednisolone, which is a steroid, uh, labetalol, um, and hydralazine for hypertension. And then two and a half later, uh, two and a half hours later, developed left sided chest pain um, and a wide complex tachycardia, which can be life threatening, and was ultimately found to have a pheochromocytoma. So um, the point here is that you you want to avoid these triggers because um, they can make the Hulk come out. So um, just highlighting a few agents here, uh, the major ones being metoclopramide or Reglan and steroids, and as well, labetalol and hydralazine probably did not help in this circumstance. Um, and then the, the, this final case here is a 16-year-old female um, who uh, had a known pheochromocytoma and was presenting for an operation. Um, and when she got to the operating room, she had hypertension uh, here to uh, 180 over 120 
uh, or 190 over 120 with a heart rate of 170. She received propanolol and the blood pressure uh, was still high as was the heart rate. So she then received magnesium sulfate and within 90 seconds, the blood pressure uh, dramatically improved uh, as did the heart rate. And uh, the surgery was able to be completed uneventfully. So uh, the take home point here is that magnesium sulfate uh, is a seldom used agent, but it can be very helpful in controlling hypertension uh, and arrhythmias. Um, and a final just thank you to uh, uh, all of our patients here at the NIH, uh, definitely my mentor, Dr. Pitsak. Thank you again to the FIO Pair Alliance for inviting me to speak here. Uh, and a special thank you to my girlfriend, Bailey, uh, and, our, and our dog, uh, Roby, who uh, have basically uh, definitely helped me get through uh, residency and most of my training here. And without them um, and their support, I would not be able to give this talk. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for both of those great presentations. Um, so uh, very useful information. I think our, our audience is probably just eating this up because these are the types of things that patients really want to know and need to know, um, especially those who are trying to be diagnosed. So um, I get a couple of minutes here to talk. So let me tell the audience a little bit about my story. So. Um, I had symptoms for a long time, years and years, uh, palpitations, uh, episodes of tachycardia that had sent me to the emergency room. And upon getting there, nothing was wrong with me. So I would be sent home. And until finally, in around 2018, my symptoms became very, very regular. Um, what happened with me, and, and I'm going to, we don't have a lot of time. So I'll give you a short story is every time I would go to the bathroom, my blood pressure would spike within about 30 seconds of me going to the bathroom. My blood pressure would spike. I would get tachycardic. I would almost pass out. Um, and my blood pressure would go from really high spike to bottom out. It would get really low. Um, so uh, I, as I kind of was on my journey, it came to be found out that my paraganglioma was in my bladder. And so what was happening is that tumor was being stimulated. But on my journey, I definitely had, um, you know, some of these instances where my blood pressure was just kind of out of control and, and my local doctors were not sure what was happening. Um, so a few take-home tips that I'll, I'll give to, um, to the audience uh, that I learned. And again, these are just things that I learned along, along the way. And you did hear some of these tips, by the way, from, from our experts here. Water, 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 all right? You definitely want to drink and hydrate. Do not allow yourself to even be close to being dehydrated. Uh, you need that blood volume. You, one of the ways you're gonna help get that is to drink water, all right? So, so it's very, very important that even if you don't feel thirsty, that you continue to drink water and hydrate yourself as much as you possibly can. So stay hydrated. Um, the other thing is if you are in one of these um, you know, kind of feelings of this panic, this anxiety, you, your blood pressure may be elevating. Um, take a deep breath. Do everything that you can to kind of settle yourself. This is very hard to do. I know I've been there. Um, but if you can try to calm yourself, try to relax, try to take a deep breath, several deep breaths, and just settle yourself. Um, this this will help you. Um, it doesn't always make the feelings go away, but it can at least help lessen the anxiety. And, and anxiety is one of the things that we do get with these tumors. Um, you heard this also in here, get a blood pressure cuff. You need to invest in one of those. You need to make sure that it's calibrated um, and you need to take your blood pressure quite frequently and monitor that and track it. Um, so it's important that you have that information for your doctor to know what is your blood pressure doing. Um, even on your own, you might take, um, you know, your blood pressure from a lying down, sitting up, standing up uh, position so that you have those different blood pressures so that your doctor knows what is happening in those different positions. Um, again, you heard this, you heard this earlier, avoid caffeine. It is a diuretic. You need that blood volume. And if you're, if you're uh, ingesting caffeine, 
that's not going to help you. All right. So those are those are some some take home tips that that I would give you. Um, I you know my blood blood pressure was swinging wildly. I was I was even though my uh, norepinephrine was not completely off the chart, I was very sensitive um, to it, and so I was having a lot of symptoms. And so I did have to really begin to watch my triggers. Um, I had to go on a very low uh, tyramine diet. Um, and so, you know, for some of you that may, may help also is, you know, to avoid the tyramine. Um, it did help me a little bit. I can't say it helped a ton, but it did help a little bit. Um, so those are some things that, you know, as we talk about, you know, this session is about the hypertensive crisis. Um, if you feel like you are in crisis mode, um, it's okay to call 911. Uh, I think most doctors would say do that rather than let something get out of control and then you have an adverse event. Um, and even if they get to your house, as they came to my house several times, and by the time they got there, my blood pressure was settling back down to some degree. It never totally settled all the way back down. It's it's kind of always was in a flux, but my heart rate might be settled back down a little bit. And again, it never totally did, but at least it wasn't off the charts. Um, they would check me out, say, I think you're okay, but it's up to you if you want to go to the emergency room. And sometimes I did, and sometimes I didn't. It would, it would depend on how bad I actually felt in this hypertensive crisis that I was in. So never feel bad if you feel like you do need to call 911 or get to an emergency room. That I always just tell people, play it safe. You know, it's better safe than sorry. Um, but, but do what you can to help yourself. So avoid the caffeine, monitor that blood pressure, drink lots of water. Those would be some of my tips and tricks, um, just having kind of been through this. Uh, and I'm always happy to, you know, to talk or answer personal questions. But at this point, we're going to take questions from the audience. Um, so I'm going to pose these questions to Dr. Nazari or Dr. Cohen, and um, you all can just decide who wants to answer or if you want me to direct it one way or another, we can do it that way as well. Um, let's see. So a couple of questions. Um, in a patient with a known functional FIO, would you advise physicians against trying to feel the tumor during an examination? Well, I mean, I can answer. I mean, I mean, most of them you can't feel like they, you know, they, they impossible to feel honestly, unless you have a head and neck lesion. Um, okay. I mean, usually even if you palpate that, I mean, it's not like, I mean, I don't, I don't think that's a problem, honestly. Uh, I mean, usually you can't feel it. And even if you can, I mean, you're not going to be feeling it to any great extent. I mean, I would, I wouldn't, I mean, that's not something I think is a major concern, you know, okay. clinically anyway. Okay. Is there a situation where a biopsy of a suspected FIO or para is recommended? So, do we actually, biopsy? I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, maybe I'll take this one and you can do the next one. Um, I mean, almost always we never biopsy because it's really dangerous and, you know, patient has to be blocked. Um, the only time we, like if it's in a, a place that is like typical for fear of para or head and neck region, we've never biopsy. I mean, there's just no reason to do it. But for example, like yourself, if you have it in the bladder, sometimes we don't know what those lesions are. Um, if they lit up on a dotate scan, for example, then you don't need to biopsy them either. But if you really don't know and, um, you know, then you're going to biopsy. But hopefully somebody's thought about a paraganglioma of the bladder and checked catecholamines and metanephrines and they they block you before they have the biopsy because it can be very dangerous. You could have a huge hypertensive crisis and, you know, could be life-threatening. So for most of the time, we don't biopsy. But if we do, I mean, it should be done under blockade. But, you know, we do get patients who get referred to us all the time that have never like they had a biopsy, nobody even like thought that this could, you know, even be a fear of para, but even when it was in the adrenal gland. And then, you know, <laughs> that could be super dangerous. So, yes. I mean, bottom line is, I think when you have any of these type of situations, 
you need to go to a center where they have a lot of experience with these tumors so that they're not going to make these kind of you know mistakes so they're very aware of what to do all right thank you all right dr nizari we'll we'll send this one your way um if a patient has a non-secreting tumor found incidentally should they still be blocked for surgery um i, I would say uh largely no um but it is important to make sure that um, they, they've checked the secretory markers. And there, there's always um, stories. So, so uh, typically we say catecholamines have um, the ability to detect a tumor as low as 10 millimeters or a centimeter, whereas metanephrines can really detect a tumor as, as small as six millimeters. Um, but nonetheless, let's say you got it imaged a few years ago. Um, if that tumor is grown and now it is secretory, um, that would be sort of uh, a complex situation where you would want to have blockade. But but otherwise, uh, for tumors that are non secretory, blockade is not necessary. Okay, great. Let's check our time, make sure. Oh, okay, we have plenty of time. All right, let's take a couple more. Um, is there problems caused post surgery? from often years of these excess hormones causing high blood pressure and constant high heart rate. So again, we're here, we're talking. So we've had constant high blood pressure, constant high heart rate. We do have the surgery. And then now we're looking after the surgery. Can that cause problems? So, I mean, I don't know. I can go ahead. Um, I mean, sure, it, can, it can cause problems, of course, if you have this high catecholamines for a long time. So, I mean, a lot of people actually present more commonly pre-surgery with like a, what we call a catecholamine cardiomyopathy, where their heart is really like in basically in heart failure from such an overwhelming amount of catecholamines. And actually after surgery, you see it would return to normal, which is really um, good. But I think, you know, there's not a lot of research. I mean, maybe you know something else, but I mean, there's not a lot of research in this area at all. And, um, you know, we don't have like any big studies to, to say, but for most people, once you remove that catecholamine load, they actually, they, their cardiac function improves, obviously the blood pressure improves. Even if they have metastatic disease, if you, if you remove that primary tumor with a huge load I mean in general I feel like um, you know in my experience after seeing many many patients um, most of their parameters actually improve I don't know if you want to comment anymore yeah I completely agree there's really only two major studies that have looked at uh, catecholamine cardiomyopathy that's probably the big one um, and uh, the, the catecholamines do affect the heart the heart uh, weighs more the mass increases um, and that can lead to functional problems. Um, but largely like Dr. Cohen was saying, the majority uh, of those changes almost entirely normalize at six months after a section. Um, and, and so um, unless you, you suffer like an adverse event, a stroke or something like that, which obviously has its own sort of what we call sequelae, um, a lot of the times uh, the, the prognosis is favorable and a lot of these changes, like this remodeling of the heart um, reverses once the catecholamines are removed. So let me, let me ask a follow-up question. Is it, this isn't from our audience, but maybe they're, they're wondering. So what if you are six months to a year out from that surgery, you had that primary tumor removed, but yet you're still not feeling well, maybe having symptoms and maybe still having heart rate and blood pressure fluctuations. What would that, what might that trigger from, from the doctor's perspective? So, I mean, um, I can answer. I mean, I think, you know, you're always going to look for other signs of disease, you know, um, because if, you know, maybe they, they have another primary tumor or they have metastatic disease. So, I mean, that's first to exclude that. But I mean, we, you know, I don't know. I mean, you living with this disease, you know, I mean, <laughs> a lot of patients, you know, even afterwards, I think they left with a lot of anxiety and, you know, 
like psychological stress and sometimes they have these symptoms and you know we do everything and it's normal and it's just they don't have disease but they have a lot of anxiety so sometimes it can be you know even psychological which is which is kind of you would ex accept that in in a way that they've been through like a very traumatic type of situation but as long as you rule out um, any, you know, a new primary because we see a lot of people with multiple primaries or metastatic disease. Um, you know, then you just, you know, you repeat that like a year later and just make sure nothing else is going on. But I mean, you know, a lot of people, I mean, I'm a hypertension specialist, nephrologist, so <laughs> tons of people have high blood pressure and sometimes your high blood pressure is just because you have high blood pressure. Another thing is people after FIO, you know, they their metabolism is so ramped up. So afterwards they they gain a lot of weight. So then the blood pressures will go up from the weight gain and not necessarily, it's got nothing to do with the, the um, you know, hormone situation. So, you know, we can, everyone can become hypertensive, you know, for other reasons too. And we see that a lot. So, you know, you've got to also think of common things, even in an uncommon situation. Very good. That's, uh, those are good things. And, and sometimes not always talked about, I think, so that's good to hear. I think I think patients who are listening are going to be like, "Oh, okay, that actually makes sense." Um, yes, and as someone who has been through it, I I, I think that we need to do a study somewhere on PTSD because uh, I think some patients actually probably have it. <laughs> uh, let's see. We'll take maybe one or two more. Um, all right. Let's see. Um, do you handle a patient who presents with more tachycardia and not so much high blood pressure differently than you would a patient who tends to have high blood, to have a higher blood pressure? Um, Dr. Nazar, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, so you definitely can. Uh, so if, if someone is having uh, more tachycardia than they are hypertension, uh, hypertension, let's say, for example, you have a patient who actually has normal blood pressures um, and a fast heart rate. Um, you can use certain agents like diltiazem as a calcium channel blocker that doesn't cause as much of a low blood pressure uh, and can treat the fast heart rate in these patients. And then there's a newer agent that's called a Corlinor or a Vabradine, which was originally approved for heart failure. Um, and it really has no effect on uh, high blood pressure uh, on blood pressure. Um, but it can treat the fast heart rate. Um, uh, so there's definitely a variety of agents that can be used uh, to treat uh, tachycardia on its own. And then there are, this is rare, um, and it's mostly seen in patients with MEN2, where they actually have low blood pressure uh, in the setting of, of having a FIO. Uh, most of the time, it's a pheochromocytoma, almost always. Um, and, and that that presentation is oftentimes due to epinephrine, um, and they may have actually low blood pressure and tachycardia. Um, and uh, that's probably the one and only example uh, where you could try giving a beta blocker without an alpha blocker, um, though it should be done uh, with expert consultation. And you can use something called propranolol, which is an older med that's been around for a long time. You can start with very low doses and you can actually, that may actually bring their blood pressure up and treat their fast heart rate. Excellent. And, and again, um, I think this was said in our chat at some point, this is why it's so important for patients to be seen by a team who has experience, we hope at a center of excellence, um, but if not at a center of excellence, at least by a team who has experience uh, with these tumors because they are very complex um, and they cause a lot of things, um, you know, that if you don't know what you're doing, it could not be good, right? That, that old incredible hawk may have a really bad outcome. <laughs> so, um, all right. I think we have time for one more and then we will close for today. So, um, is there, and we may have touched on this a little bit, um, are there, is there a situation where a patient does not need to be blocked before a surgery or some other procedure that they're going to have? So I can take it. I mean, 
the the only the only situation is is like if we absolutely sure that they're not secreting any hormones. Otherwise, I mean, you're never going to do it. Even if it, if so, firstly, I mean, say sometimes, like for example, someone comes to us, they were going for a bypass surgery, and in in the workup for the bypass, they found to have a fear. We always do the fear of surgery first. But if you have like having surgery for another reason, like metastatic, but you still have metastatic disease, then you're going to block them. Even if they have underlying disease, but you're not having surgery on the fear, you know, or the, or whatever, the paraganglioma or any of the metastatic disease, but they have those high levels of hormone, we're still going to block them, even if the surgery is not for, you know, for anything related to the disease. So there, there's very, you know, it, it basically comes down to whether you have any hormonal um, increase or not. But I can tell you, I mean, I was part of the metastatic PO guidelines for blind blood pressure. That was the section that I did, but it was a consensus thing. But even people feel if you have a very large tumor, um, some people even felt that you should even be blocked, even with a large tumor, which is not secreting, because when you touch it, you know, there's potential for that tumor. It's still, it still may secrete hormones. So it's quite controversial. I mean, it's not like set in stone, but I mean, it's, it's better to err on the side of safety and block someone, then, you know, they have them have a, a high potential crisis or bad outcome. Right, right. Okay, very good. I want to, I was looking for any last minute questions that came in here. Uh, can catecholamine related heart failure interfere with treatment options? Ooh, that's a big question. Dr. Nazar, you want to take that one? I yeah, I can take this one. It is, um, you know, we're, we're saying this now, uh, and I wish I could tell you that the answer is straightforward. Um, but uh, there's a variety of different heart failures. Um, and so a pheopera can cause sort of different types of heart failure. The most, the, sort of the one that you hear uh, most commonly is what we call a stress-like cardiomyopathy. You might've heard the term Takotsubo-like cardiomyopathy. Um, which is just one of the types of heart failure that you can see. Um, and that one's interesting because the catecholamines can actually suppress uh, the heart from contracting. Um, and in that situation, uh, they're almost always, uh, they almost always have some level of epinephrine because it's really thought that the epinephrine is, is what's doing this. Um, and in that situation, propranolol, uh, is a medication that we, we we oftentimes will use in that particular situation. Um, there are other types of heart failure, like what we call like a dilated cardiomyopathy, um, that can occur uh, just just from the rigors of having high blood pressure, uh, as well as as something that we call. Uh, uh, this is a, a functional distinction, but heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, where the the heart actually um, instead of being stunned or or billowing out, like in the dilated sense, uh, it, it starts to hypertrophy, just like when you exercise and your muscles get bigger, the heart gets bigger. Um, and in those situations, the treatments are a little bit more nu nuanced and there are certain things you do want to avoid. Um, and and uh, if I had the time, I would uh, go on and on about it, but I would say um, in those situations, uh, you just want to make sure that you, that you have a team, like you were saying, Shauna, um, and uh, we can certainly help with that um, just because we, we do see that from time to time. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank great you both. Question. That is a great question. Thank you both for an awesome session. I think this is going to be viewed many, many times uh, for patients to, to, especially those who are maybe still in that early diagnosis and trying to talk to doctors who may want to do a biopsy like mine did. And I kept saying, no, you're not biopsying it. <laughs> I had a doctor try to do that to me. Um, I knew actually more about it than he did. <laughs> so believe that or not, it's true. Um, I had to tell him no three times because he kept trying to take me to biopsy. And I said, I refuse, I'm not going. Um, so I think patients are going to really enjoy this session. Thank you so much for really um, telling us information that's important um, and that is kind of down to earth for us to understand. So we truly appreciate that. Um, for everyone who's watching, there is a feedback survey that you can click on. I'm not sure exactly where the link is right at the moment, um, but if you can give us some feedback on this presentation, we would be happy to have it.
Uh, again, a special thanks to Progenix and our other sponsors for making this conference and this session possible. Um, this session will be um, available to view tomorrow. Everything should be posted tomorrow. And uh, we hope that you enjoy the rest of our conference in the upcoming days. So thanks everyone for joining. Bye-bye. Thanks.